first, a little intro. For those who listened last week, I got this flu, I think it's at the tail end. But without my loyal listeners, it would have been a lot worse. What happened is Florida is in a heat wave, and, well, I'm feeling that, but it downpoured, and my car wouldn't start, and I, without a car, I can't even get to the closest grocery. That meant a tow truck, and that meant repaired. And without Gedalia, a loyal listener who came to visit uh, me and Cindy uh, in Florida, and has stayed loyal since, without this little generous contribution, I would never have got the car out in time, but he was there, and don't think it's unappreciated. Thank you, Gedalia. All right, our first guest, um, well, those who know the show a bit know John Levy is an attorney, uh, but I am understanding him better all the time. He's one of the uh, lead counsel for the plaintiffs of what is called, uh, well, it's uh, a canon law petition. Uh, he'll dive into that uh, later. But what impressed me this time around, what do you know, the New York Times are commenting on his work. Now, we'll leave that for a little later. First of all, John, how are you? I, I'm good, Barry. Sorry to hear you're under the weather, but I hope you're on the oh. mend. Yes. Last week was torture, and now it's, well, it's um, mere, what's minor torture? <laughs> it's, yeah. it's on the mend. We're, we're doing fine. Now, I'm going to start with your research, a little background. This is a major, major, major issue that really is not known, and you've been at it since 1999, um, when the uh, State Department uh, mentioned that the Nazi, well, in short, they took a lot of loot uh, from what is now, well, basically Yugoslavia, but they, uh, it was looted from Serbian, Jewish, and Roma victims of the Holocaust, and Ten truckloads for safekeeping. First of all, safekeeping for who? Yeah, well, that that's the tip of the iceberg, as it's turned out. Um, the, our case originally had to do with that Ustasha treasury from former Yugoslavia, um, which which was ten truckloads of treasure brought down to St. Peter's Square in 1946 for safekeeping and. Uh, deposited in the Vatican Bank. That's pretty well documented, but in the course of our research, we have found out that the amount of loot collected by the Vatican before and after the Second World War and not accounted for is immense, probably 50 times more than that 10 truckloads. And is we're, it we're all the same petition? Well, that, the petition has to do with that one instance of the Ustasha Treasury, but we are alluding to larger amounts of money that was deposited in the Vatican Bank right after the Second World War from Hungary, Slovakia, well, how, Romania, we, by those, by the outgoing governments. Um, they didn't much, want to... Mm -hmm. How much are you going for? Uh, what's it all worth? We don't know, Barry. We don't know. And, and of course, I also represent uh, Ethiopian uh, Ethiopians who have claims against the Vatican regarding from the uh, regarding the Italian invasion of Ethiopia in 1936 through an occupation through 1941. We have proof positive that a lot of loot was from that also flowed back to the Vatican. So some of this material is it's priceless. It's treasure taken from churches, Orthodox Christian churches, and Jewish synagogues. Um, and you know. It's, it's, uh, I suppose I can imagine why they'd give it to the Nazis, uh, but can you tell me why they would loot and not keep it for themselves? Right. Now, in the case of the Italians, in the case of the Italians in Ethiopia, that, that was a special project of the Vatican and Italy, it had the blessing of the Pope, Pope Pius XI and Pius XII, 
uh, to Christianize that because Ethiopians were Orthodox Christians. They wanted to make that a Roman Catholic country. And of course, Mussolini had, uh, you know, visions of being the incarnation of the Roman emperor. So, so a lot of the loot from monasteries and churches, including potentially the copy of the Ark of the Covenant, or perhaps the real Ark of the Covenant, ended up in Rome. A lot of priceless manuscripts and they were shuttled over to the Vatican as part of that deal. Now, the other loot, which ended up there during and after the Second World War, was simply because the Vatican Bank was one of the few banks that was still operating that the uh, fascists, both in, throughout Europe, could have access to. It was in Rome. It was in a neutral country, Vatican City, that was not necessarily unsympathetic to some of the fascist governments. And after the Second World War, they, they desperately needed a place to put their loot. You know, the, the stuff that was left over, uh, they didn't want to turn it over to the Allies or to um, uh, Stalin. So they, uh, best they could, put it with the Vatican Bank for safekeeping. So that's how it all got in there. And then there's also the matter, and it's not my work, but it's alluded to in the uh, New York Times editorial from January, July 29. <laughs> by Gerald Posner, who I know about insurance policies. Insurance Hold policies on, on Jews. Jeff, Jeff, your time's yet, so you're going to lose all my listeners. Yes. Let's do it slowly, and everyone, we're all going to get educated. That's the big issue, and it's congratulations, by the way, um, uh, just getting this out there. But let's do it one by one. First of all, you quote something called the tablet, which is uh, the Catholic uh, newspaper version of Penthouse, I imagine. <laughs> uh, and what you're saying is Cardinal George Pell, here's a quote from him, the Vatican is committed to transparency and the use of contemporary international standards in financial reporting, and then he praises another cardinal, um, and this one is not from St. Louis, it's John Baptiste de France, oh, like I know his name, de France, okay, director of the Vatican Bank, and what Cardinal Pell says, uh, here's his quote, Pope John Francis continues to insist that financial reforms must continue. Well, if there was nothing wrong, why are there reforms? Well, what are you well my, my, my reply is, why would you put Cardinal Pell, the man who is accused of covering up massive sexual abuse in Australia, and is facing charges down there, um, why would you put him in charge of cleaning, quote-unquote, cleaning up the Vatican Bank and Vatican Finance? It sounds more like a cover-up to me. Oh, I, I would say you got a good one here. Uh, my reading of this really is your side, <laughs> okay. okay? Yeah, Pell, 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 is, Pell is a crook and a criminal, and there's a lot of people in Australia where he came from who'd like to get their hands on him. I mean, that's all I can say about Pell. And By the as for the rest, the rest of the cast and crew there at the Vatican Bank, they're, they're all just a bunch of you know, con men, constantly uh, different cast of characters. But it, it's it's all the same show, business as usual, and cover-up upon cover-up. Well, let's go on with your quote. We're getting to the background. And by the way, this was very useful. Uh, even the Australian thing, is there something against extraditing uh, cardinals? Why don't well, they extradite them? Well, they, they, first of all, he's a Vatican official, so they probably couldn't extradite him. And, and secondly, I, I think it, it's just too earth-shattering for even the Australians to, you know, the guy who's their highest-ranking Catholic churchman um, to try to extradite him. But I, as I understand it, they're trying to work question him. They're trying to question him, and we've seen this in the U.S. where the where the cardinal covers up for the uh, child molesters in the Catholic Church. So. That's what the man does. That's his, you know, stock and trade. And, uh, you know, that's whether it's finance or whether it's lawsuits regarding sexual abuse, that, that is where Pell is useful to Pope Francis. 
All right, let's continue with your background. This is very important stuff, and you, by the way, you summarized it uh, very well. The Ustasha Treasury was the subject of a decade-long lawsuit against the Vatican Bank by Holocaust survivors. Uh, I guess not you, decades is not you. Uh, but it resulted in the four-day testimony of U.S. Special Agent William Gowan. Who did he testify to? Yeah, well, actually, I've been on the case since 1998. <laughs> so that is, that is me. I've been on it all the time Please. from the start. But, uh, yeah, Bill Gowan, uh, the one thing we got out of that decades-long uh, lawsuit was the judge finally gave us an okay to videotape testimony from the only witness who was still alive, which was Bill Gowan. He's still alive even today, just had uh, dinner with him uh, last month. And uh, he was the special agent who investigated the Vatican, the rat lines, which was the Nazi smuggling and the laundering of the Ustasha treasury back in 1947. And he gave his pretty damning testimony about the 10 trucks of treasure that he knew had pulled into St. Peter's Square and unloaded. And, of course, he had a truckload of other information because he was in charge of the, the Vatican beat down there, so to speak, in 47. So he spilled the beans on the Vatican. All right, folks, we're going to get to um, the latest, which is actually really out there now. But let's go... There was a later inquiry by the European uh, uh, Commission uh, in a referral to the, well, it resulted in a, a referral to the Vatican Financial Intelligence Unit. Isn't that a, a contradiction in terms? Yeah, well, maybe yeah, it should be the Vatican Special Cover-Up Unit, but uh, what, what happened there was after we got tossed out of the U.S. courts on jurisdictional grounds, they never did let us get to the merits of the case, even though we did have the testimony. Um, the, the federal judge somehow managed to agree with the Vatican that they had immunity from being sued in the U.S., and uh, they told us to go elsewhere, so we went to the European Commission because the Vatican uses the euro and the anti-money laundering laws of the European Commission are in effect, in, even in the Vatican, although they admit they have no way to force the Vatican Bank to follow the law. So that's why we went there, and we kind of went from office to office, from Brussels back to Rome, and back and forth over to the European Central Bank in Berlin. And, you know, eventually it, it just went nowhere it, that, uh, you know, everyone was saying, well, the Vatican should should follow the law, but, you know, maybe maybe the Vatican Bank is immune. They, they keep coming back to that. It's God's bank. You can't really force them to follow anti-money money laundering laws and account for this huge I, I, case. Yeah. Why not? Well, I mean, as it was explained to me by the European commissioners, um, the Vatican Bank, they said, well, we're not sure if that's part of Vatican City or the Holy See, and our agreements with Vatican City, and that the Vatican's insisting the Vatican Bank is part of the Holy See, and um, when I produced a sworn document from our court case where the uh, attorney for the Vatican um, and the Vatican Bank had said it's under both the Vatican uh, city and the Holy See. They just ignored me and said, go to the, go to the Vatican Financial Intelligence Unit, who, uh, of course, never did respond to us after numerous, uh, complaints from us. And that's why we went with the canon law petition, which, uh, directly Wait, to the Pope, who has never responded. You're saying your suit was dismissed. Yes, it was it was dismissed on jurisdictional grounds, which, as you know, is not on the merits. It was just saying you can't sue the Vatican Bank in the U.S. Go take it somewhere else, is what we were told by the U.S. court. Go take it to Europe, which is what we've done. We took it to the European Commission. They said take it to the Pope, which is what we did, where it sits with Pope. But uh, you were the runaround. Of course. 
But now it's with Francis. Now you can see the editorial in the New York Times from last month. Um, you know what, we'll get to that. I've got issues I want to discuss with you and only you. And by the way, be very, very careful with my poor old body. Something invaded it, all right? Now, first things first, go to the New York Times article. Who wrote it? What did it say? When was it published? You want to get that first. I can feel it. Get, I, let's I do. Go. I think it's important. We know that getting an op-ed in the New York Times is important. The New York Times uh, vets very carefully what goes in there. So July 29 of this year, uh, an op-ed, How the Vatican Can Shed Light on the Holocaust. And, and the uh, reason for this was the Pope went to Auschwitz and prayed. And a gentleman by the name of Gerald Posner, former journalist, a well-known writer who's written about uh, Nazis and worked, used to be at the staff of the Daily Beast. And Posner wrote a book um, last year, came out, he worked on it for years, and I gave him a lot of my files. He wrote a book called God's Bankers. And uh, so Posner comes out with his op-ed telling, just simply saying, hey, the Vatican should come clean and, so, and, and uh, open up its files from World War II and post-World War II to clear up three matters. And one matter, of course, is what did they know about the final solution? Uh, Posner, and I agree, I agree with Posner, the Vatican certainly knew what was going on and was getting first-hand reports. Secondly, what sort of dirty financing was going on with the Third Reich and Mussolini during the Second World War? And Posner has brought to light a whole new level of things where Posner has proof the Vatican profited from life insurance policies on Jews. Now, that would be profitable, wouldn't it, Barry? I don't want to be flipping about it, but if you're killing well, they Jews, it would be a quite How a profitable they, line of business. Hmm? How could they profit? They were clearly not beneficiaries. Well, apparently, and you know, Posner could probably give us the details, but the Vatican brokered the Vatican Bank brokered these. Got when, when the let us go back when the when all these fascists go and take people's property as the enemy of state, enemy of the state. They were very efficient. That's the main thing. It was financial. So before they killed Jews, they would empty out the safe deposit box, everything else, or hold them up for ransom or whatever. And part of that is turn over your life insurance policies. So. Thousands, tens of thousands of Jews had to turn over their life insurance policies and sign them away uh, to, guess who, the Third Reich. And then, of course, what happened to those Jews? Well, at that point, you know, your life insurance, uh, your life isn't going to be very long, is it? So, and the Vatican was one of the, according to Posner, was one of the investors in that scheme of, I would, what they call it now, viatical life insurance where you invest in life insurance policies and you're betting the person is going to die. Um, in this case, the uh, Nazis picked up the, the insurance policies for free at the point of a gun, and then assuredly the insured was going to die. Now, weren't they? Well, in America, I saw a report on this. American companies, if you die they won't, and you're a beneficiary, they uh, won't inform you that you've got money waiting for you. It's a very crooked business, uh, apparently. Look, you know what? This is bigger than... You get me Posner's phone number, I'll put him on the show, and then I'll write about this whole thing. It's a major, major issue. And the third issue must somewhere be the rat lines. Yes, operation. rat lines in the Ustasha Treasury. What happened after the second... What, what happened post-war there? Why were all these Nazis congregating around the Vatican, some of them hiding out in the Vatican. Why was the Vatican in the, in the no. Nazi smuggling business? It wasn't some. They were, it was an industry uh, saving Nazis through uh, Catholic monasteries. Right, that's right. That, that, that's, that's how a lot of them came out. That's how Eichmann came out. That's how Artukovic, who was the only one that the U.S. ever uh, extradited, got into the U.S. So um, it was a big business, and it went on for quite a while. Part of it, of course, in partnership with the CIA later on. But, um, you know. That, that's another major issue. You've got a whole bunch of them here. Um, right. 
I do a little she do between me and Posner. Uh, it's time I wrote again. Uh, my computer was knocked out twice, and technology is winning. Uh, but I think this really deserves. I've got a, a pretty big just on my writing list. My my email list is fifteen thousand. I think we can expand this. So let let's work together. Right. I'll, I'll send you his email. Um, I'm, I'm sure he'll cooperate with you once, of course, obviously get more of his book out there, God's Bankers. So um, <coughs> that's there's the, the pressure is mounting on, on the Vatican, um, and, and, and we can kind of take the temperature because the New York Times doesn't do something for no reason. They're not altruistic, Barry. They do it for a reason. They wouldn't give me the time of day, but they, they decided they were going to go with Posner's uh, op-ed. So they, they do it because there is now a trend toward pushing the Vatican to open up its records. And by golly, there's going to be a lot of information in there about massive amounts of money laundering and dirty business. And, and I think also we're going to find a lot of artifacts from synagogues and Orthodox uh, Christian churches are hiding out there at the Vatican uh, Museum. All right. Now, folks, um, we do this. Next part is important because the canon law petition is online and you can actually see John Levy's uh, petition. Certainly he is uh, on, if not the head uh, of the plaintiffs, he's up there. Tell people how to see it. Yeah, you can you can use Google and you can Google my name, Jonathan Levy, J-O-N-A-T-H-A-N-L-E-V-Y. Probably just Vatican petition, and it, it will come up. We've got it posted in as many places as possible, as well as uh, William Gowan's four-volume deposition. We've made that available too. It's up on my Scribd D or Scribd D or Scribd account, probably elsewhere. So you know, go hunt for that stuff. Um, it's 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 all oh, around. Reason to hunt. Let's give a uh, let's give your address. Yeah, I'm hunting. You can you yeah. can contact me um, at uh, info i n f o at brimstone b r i m s t o n e a n d company dot com. So brimstone and company dot com. It's my law office. Just drop me an email, and uh, you can put a link up there too to my website if you want, Barry. Whatever you want to do. So all right, people, put it. Yeah, you so have people, a website. Let's put it out there right now. I, I'll send that to you. I can um, send you the website. Now, for, all right, listeners, we're archived for a week at libertyarchives.com. If you missed it, you have a week to get it. And once again, last week, by the way, I did a one-hour show. I was in such agony. And, folks, I want you to bear with me. We have a break coming up where I'm going to be taking Pepto Bismol and whatever is needed to defeat a flu. And before then, after that, I've got major issues. You think this was good? Wait till you see what's coming up. Look, all my books are. Oh, we'll get to that, folks. We have three minutes. Uh, hang in there, John. And in three minutes, we'll be back. And my body is failing, but my mind is really with you. All right. We'll be back in three minutes, folks. This is Barry Chambers. Since the beginning of time, kings have sought it. Nations have fought for it. It has been traded. It has been borrowed. It has been purchased. It has been stolen. There's a reason for it. To secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and to our posterity. Invest with the security of gold and silver. Call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188 or visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net. Listen to Financial Survival with your host, Melody Cedarstrom, right here on FirstAmendmentRadio.com at 4 p.m. Eastern or 1 p.m. Pacific Time. Visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net or call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188. Toll free, 1-800-375-4188.
The book of Revelation says, the spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus Christ. This is at the very heart of FirstAmendmentRadio.com. In that spirit, we have created the Prophecy Reality News app for all of your mobile devices. Streaming First Amendment Radio 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Available for your Apple, Android device, and smartphone absolutely free. Get the Prophecy Reality News app installed today so you can listen to First Amendment Radio wherever you are. The Prophecy Reality News app. Get it now. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. That's CrossTheBorder.org. I know you all want answers, and believe me, so do I, and I'll do my best to get them. Despite Nicolas Cage's promise to do his best to get left behind rapture answers for us, don't hold your breath. Not everyone believes left behind is true prophecy. Some may even regard as conspiratorial the mainstream re-release of the Left Behind movie with actor Nicolas Cage portraying the main character as an attempt to further reinforce in the minds of all this perception of false prophecy in order to condition the masses for the play about to begin. If you want true Bible prophecy answers, get the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. The author exposes the Latin rapture origin, the seven-year tribulation deception, true Bible revelation of Daniel's 70 weeks, the abomination of desolation, the restrainer, America in the revelation, the image of the beast, and the mark of the beast, and the truth about God's chosen people, and so much more about Bible prophecy. This book will shatter the left behind paradigm of future events. Get the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of the book, the rapture will be canceled. That's crossTheBorder.org. Vatican and what it's doing in Israel and who the real Shimon Peres is the Vatican agent, he's been handing back stuff and he wants 63 sites in Israel returned to the Vatican. He was, you know, a strange uh, book by uh, Leah Rabin had a little itty bitty point that he was in Poland, a rare Jew educated by the Jesuits. It, for that book, is called, well, Shatayzvi, Labor Zionism, and the Holocaust. That and all my books are at lulu.com, that's www.lulu.com. There's a search box, just write in Barry Chammer, C-H-A-M-I-S-H, books, you'll get to all of them. And my website is www.barrychamish.com Jonathan, back to you. Right. All right, let's go. Here's a major issue. And it's... I'm going to just quote you. And it's better you do all the talking or close to it from now on. The canon law uh, claims that Eustachia Treasury was recycled through the Vatican Bank to the CIA-backed Croatian nationalists in their decades-long effort to create an independent Croatian state. Dive into this. Yeah, well, of course, a lot of all that money, not just the money from former Yugoslavia, but the money from Hungary, from Slovakia, from Romania, 
uh, wherever, from Italy, wherever there was uh, fascist governments allied with Nazi Germany's, that the money that was left as they were retreating at the last couple months of the uh, Second World War and the loot that they had was deposited down there at the Vatican Bank, tacitly with the cooperation of the Allies, with at least some of the British MI6 and some of the uh, proto-CIA people like James Angleton um, going along with the project, because the, the idea was that the, the uh, former fascists and Nazis would be using that money um, not to establish a Fourth Reich, but to fight communism. That was the idea. So they took the loot from concentration camps and from churches and synagogues, and they, they took the money that was stolen, and they, the idea was to, to fight communism. That's why they backed Croatians against the Serbians? Well, they, they, they backed Croatia against Yugoslavia, which was Tito, who was a communist, and then later on against Milosevic, who was Tito's successor, who was a socialist. So, again, it, it was the same same thing, and, and the money was also used to back Hungarians in their abortive 1956 uprising, and it was used for all manner of, you know, covert activities. Um, and, for course, the, the, one of the big costs was the rat lines, various rat lines, that took these former fascists anywhere from concentration camp guards on up to elite members of the SS and redistribute them around the world to South America, to Spain, and to the Middle East, with in, in Egypt and Syria. Um, why, that would was the, I, why would why they, they do that? Well, th th those are assets. Those are they, the way they viewed it is those are anti-communist assets, and we're going to put them in these countries to make sure the communists don't get a foothold in South America or in, or in the Middle East or in or in Spain. Um, and they did their job. A lot of these top Nazis were quote unquote security experts, Barry. So that's why people like Klaus Barbie of the Gestapo advised the Paraguayan government on security. That's why Ante Pavlic, the former head of Croatia during the second, uh, second world war advised one of the, uh, Peronist government of Argentina and also the Paraguayan government on security matters. That's why you had Nazis up in Colombia advising the governments there on security matters. That's why you had Nazis in Egypt and Syria advising those governments on security Israel and military. Hmm? I thought publicly Israel was our asset. Did any of this money go to it? Did it get in the hands of the Israelis? Well, no. There, there were payoffs made, of course, to the Jewish World Congress as part of that Swiss bank, and the, the, there were some banking payoffs made in the uh, late 1990s, early part of this century, to uh, Bronfman and Company at the Jewish World Congress. Um, they shook down a that lot of uh, money. A What's that? The booze banker got the money. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Well, he, he, he got it for the Jewish World Congress and for the uh, various organizations that administered that money, and there were small payouts made to Holocaust survivors. And, and of course, money was paid. Money's been paid all along by Germany to, to victims of the Holocaust. So um, some money was paid out, but the vast money that was sent to the Vatican, which is what we're talking about, was never paid out. The Vatican won't even admit that it had its hands on that money. So that, that is what's this, whereas the Germans, the Austrians, even the French have admitted and paid at least some settlements. The Vatican has never paid a penny. Well, they're bearing obvious, I think, more than obvious historical facts. Can this go on forever? I, Barry, I don't know. There, for example, I'll give you an example. At the Vatican Museum and Vatican Library, I, I believe it's at the Vatican Library. The Vatican Library catalog has a couple hundred ancient Ethiopian manuscripts looted by the Italians from monasteries there during the uh, Second World War. And it, it's right there in the Providence. It's from Cheruli, it says, who was the governor of Gondor province in um, Ethiopia. He looted the monasteries there and gave the uh, 
manuscripts to the uh, Vatican Library, where they are today. And when we approach the Vatican Library on this matter, because the Ethiopians would like those manuscripts back, uh, they don't respond. Just like with the uh, Ustasha treasury and just like with what Mr. Posner is talking about and everything else. They will not respond to us mere mortals. Uh, they're going to sit there on one of the, and compound one of the largest crimes of the last century. Uh, if, I don't want to dive, but the Jews, if it, if any of this got back to Israel in any way, they'll cover it up too. They, they have, Vod Yashem, all the rest of them. We've had people go to Vod Yashem and say, what about, what do you have on uh, the Ustasha, the Croatians, and and the um, and the Ustasha treasury? And our, our representative was told to go talk about something else. Um, Wiesenthal uh, Center, okay, they send their man Zuroff out around the world, and he's allegedly the expert on the Ustasha, who were the uh, German allies there and and. Uh, and former Yugoslavia, which was the start of our case. And I asked him, I corralled Mr. Zuroff and said, what do you know, Dr. Zuroff, about the Vatican Bank and Nastasha Treasury? Well, I don't know anything about that. So it, when, when you talk about the money, the Jewish organizations clam up real fast because they've gotten their payoffs. They've gotten their billions from the Swiss banks, Swiss banks and the Austrian banks. They got their money. They got their payoffs. And additionally, a lot of the money we're talking about here is not exclusively Jewish money. You know, there are a lot of other victims of the Second World War, and a lot of that money was theirs, non-Jewish victims that were sent to the Vatican. I'm going to intrude myself for one second, no matter what my tummy is and my head is telling me. Look, I... Well, Daisy Stern is from Hebron. She's been my guest many times. Her son, Jonathan... Uh, put me on his Facebook page. I was in Los Angeles. Someone handed me a gun, and there's a picture of me holding the gun. And I wrote an article. It's not just the Holocaust victims. It's the Sephardic victims. They're not stupid. They know a crime was committed against them. But anything that a Jew does is wiped out just the same way anything that that the Vatican apparently same reaction, all right, same reaction. Uh, it's for our own survival, and we're not going to expose it. And by the way, infiltration is a major, major issue. These people believe in Mayor Kahana and Benjamin Kahana. They were both murdered by the Israelis. It's a messy world. It, it is, and there, there is collusion between the large Jewish organizations and the Vatican on this matter. Because and some ones who don't want to admit they, there could be collusion. They actually okay. support their worst enemies. That, that's true. That, that, that is true. I don't know why that is. Um, you know, but when it comes to the Vatican, we were told, hands off, buddy. Don't, we're, we're not going to support you. In fact, the Jewish World Congress commented early on when we sued the Vatican Bank that they had nothing to do with it and they didn't believe there was any Holocaust money at the Vatican. So, um, a lot of collusion there. A lot of collusion. Oh, me, you, Posner, uh, we got to get together. I've got info too. And, there's no breaking. All right, we won't go into Shimon Paris and his ties to the Vatican and infiltration and the real thing, but I got info too. Yeah, I mean, and, and of course, as you pointed out, the Vatican has always had its sights set on Jerusalem and it has its goals in the Holy Land, um, political and territorial goals and uh you know, nobody's fooled by the present Pope. He's he's just more of the same thing, if not worse. I am. Are you joking? He's the friendliest Pope in recent memory. Yeah, right. They don't even think that John Paul was murdered after 33 days of carousing in the, in the holy city. Oh, gosh. 
Well, I mean, I mean, what about it, Barry? I mean, I'm, I'm kind of a little bit of an expert on the Vatican. They've never had a situation where the previous pope retired. Popes don't retire, especially in I, a... Uh, that predecessor, he retired permanently. Another pope took over and retired, and he's still alive. That's right, Benedict. Well, what, whatever they had on old Benedict, it must have been pretty good, and I've been told they had quite a bit on him to get him out of there. Because he was a very traditional pope, and he wasn't about to retire, quote unquote. So he's still around, and um, you know, my God, it, it's it's a mess. Um, what this, this pope smiley, pope. watch out for the smiley popes. That's all I can say. Watch out for what? smiling popes. In Auschwitz, why well, wasn't there a massive Jewish protest that the pope is in Auschwitz? If anything, that's our territory. We earned it. Well, that, that's true. I mean, it is a it is a travesty um, that the Pope's there. Um, Jews cannot go uh, pray at the Temple Mount, right? But the Pope can come to Auschwitz. There you go. Uh, all right, let's go. There's something else that bothered me. We'll return to this. One of these years, I'm going to say it again, my info melds very well with your info, okay? Right. And it's been a lifetime, and who wants it to know this, anyways? You're a, you're a, an attorney. Can you uh, gain something from this? All I gain is headaches and a whole bunch of slander. <laughs> At least you, you, you have a, a living out of this. <sighs> All right, I'm going to tell you what I saw on TV this week on CBS. The only person in the world trying to track down the lost Jews who were slaughtered by the Eisens, whatever that damn unit was that went into captured Russian territory uh, with the German army with one purpose only to slaughter Jews. Right, the Einsatz group, yes. Yep. He's uncovering the dead. He's interviewing the survivor, uh, not Pope, he's a priest, he's a French priest. There was this documentary on the work he's doing, and I, I was haunted, I'm still haunted by it. They shot him, they didn't all die, they laid in the ground, the ground was moaning for three days, ha stick out your kids so we can shoot them. Oh, it was the most haunting haunting. All right. How do you explain that it is a French priest, a Catholic priest, doing, first of all, what the Jews should have been doing at Yad Vashem, and at least giving a, a name to the dead and where they were shot. And by the way, it's way more than six million. Yeah, well, I've, I've been aware, I've been aware of his work for quite. It's been going on for quite a while, and he's gone back to the killing fields in Russia and Ukraine and Belarus, and uh, worked with local people to try to find out where these mass graves were, and uh, do some, you know, exhumation or whatever to try to identify these sites. That, that's correct, and and just that, because, hmm? yeah, it's correct. Uh, look, he still a member of the Catholic Church. Well, of course, of, of yeah. course, some of the best people in the world, Barry, are Catholics. Some of the, are my biggest supporters on this case were Catholics. The people who funded this case were Catholic. So, not Jewish. The, the people who want to get to the bottom of what's going on at the Vatican Bank are largely Catholic because they're the ones that have an interest in exposing this, not the Jews. So, that, so that that's you, we smuggled a hundred thousand of your best guards uh, to Argentina. To, uh, oh Lord, I, it's still haunting me. I don't have words for the feelings I have right now. So what so, was very interesting? You mean there's yeah. a con? somewhere. What's that, Barry? There's a conscience out there. 
one half wants to bury the facts, the other half wants to exhume them? Well, correct. I, I would say most Catholics would probably like the, you know, to get to the bottom of this. Um, most most Catholics are not fascists. It, it is the church hierarchy that has been covering these matters up, and and solely for reasons I think of financial gain. Because if they had to account for this, account for the artifacts and treasures that they've got there, they, they might have to pay out some money, don't you think? And, that, that's really what it's about. They, they don't want to pay out the money. Um, yeah. As for as for individual Catholics, I think they like to get this thing behind them and you know sort this out and that's find what out I what the church is up to. What you're saying about I use that logic that the Jewish labor Zionists are not the Jews of Israel. <laughs> they are rich. The hierarchy might not be zero one percent of the Jews of Israel, but the people back them. The same way the friendly Pope Francis is given glorious celebrations wherever he shows up. Well, of course, and we've got the same phenomenon in the U.S. Very, you know, Trump, like him or hate him, has said some very good things about vetting Muslim immigrants to the U.S., but who are his biggest critics? Members of the so-called Republicans. Who are the ones who are screaming for his blood? So um, we have the same thing. And you're going to get another. Listen, I'm not following the election deliberately. Uh, if anyone cares what I think, don't vote. All right. Uh, if anyone is going to lose to Clinton, who was part of an impeachment. And you want to go through that again, it's Trump. He's the world's worst candidate. Look, agreed. All right, agreed. The system stinks wherever you go. But the Jews think Gabi Ben-Gurion and Shimon Peres were these great guys. They were their worst enemies. They kind of deal with the Nazis. Look, you know my work. Well, well it is true. Why, why don't we see the government of Israel sending a diplomatic note over to the Vatican uh, nuncio there, if they have one, they probably don't, but sending something to the, the Vatican representative saying, uh, hey, can you guys uh, start releasing some of these World War II records? Why doesn't the government of Israel do that? doesn't matter if it's labor or Likud. They don't do it. Why does the government of Israel... In all its history, with all the opportunities, convict one Nazi. The only Nazi who went to Palestine to watch the operation, the final, oh, the transfer agreement to Palestine. The Nazis supplied the labor Zionists, the original settlers, with people, and Eichmann went there to carouse with them. And oh, then Rudolf right. went to Budapest, and Eichmann offered him all the Jews, I don't want them anymore, I want 700 trucks, get me out of here. And Castor told him, forget it. Here's a list of 3,500, these I want. The British let them in. This story is way, way, way too ugly for the Jews to handle. Well, I mean, you had a UN Secretary General, Kurt Waldheim, who was a Nazi war criminal in former Yugoslavia, of all things. So, um, you know, they, they, there you go. I mean, they, they were all over. Everybody knew about Volheim, but apparently it was covered up. I think Israel he was, was it is a refuge from European fascism. It wasn't a refuge. European fascism found in the place. Yeah, so, you know, that, that is, but it would take just one diplomatic note from, from, from any government to get this done. I've tried to get the Serbian government, which has an interest in doing this. I can't even get them to send a diplomatic note over to the Vatican. Everybody is scared of the Vatican. Um, the, the only people, the only government that ever did anything was the U.S. government briefly under Clinton issued the Eisenstadt report um, from Ambassador Eisenstadt about, uh, you know, about the Ustasha treasury and money laundering by the Vatican, but they shut that down very quickly after it was done. Clinton shut it down. The fact is you and I can, can talk because what we're talking about is 
swept under the carpet. Okay. What you're okay. doing is good work. What I'm doing is good work. But for Jews to accept the, the grand truth, now nah, we're anti-Semites. Uh, it, it, it's just astounding to me that anyone would call me an anti-Semite. But you get the truth that they don't like it, that's what you are. Yep, that's right. So, you know, that, that's the problem. We're just hands off the Vatican. Oh, no, you can't, can't provoke the Vatican because they're, they're too big and too important. And I'm going to say it again, there was a deal not with the Vatican. There was, that's separate a bit. They had a deal with the Nazis, the labor Zionists. They populated the original Israel. That's where it gets super ugly. Yep, there, there, there is a lot of hidden history there, Barry. In fact, um, you know, I won't go into it in this show, but the, uh, the Ustasha themselves, the Ustasha themselves were led by people who, under the Nuremberg de decrees, w would have been considered Jews. So, so I mean, and that's another reason they don't like to talk about the Ustasha treasury because. Uh, <laughs> My dear Sir Reed, look, uh, uh, John Thing. I'm gonna, I have to make a last statement. First of all, somewhere in this underworld which I have entered somehow, um, people, I'm getting an okay reputation among some pretty good people. Our next guest is Edward Torchy Smith. He's the founder of the Baby Boomers Talk Radio. I'm gonna get you on, if he agrees, I'm going to introduce you guys, <laughs> all right? Um, and I'm honored uh, that he will be my next guest for the next hour. And all I need is a Pepto-Bismol. I'll be good with him. But, Jonathan, we did something important. Nobody wants to say that a Jew can harm his own people. And there's horrible evidence that this Holocaust was with the collaboration of some rotten, rotten people called labor Zionists. There, I said it. Anything to add? You have 30 seconds. No, I Give just want to... Well, well, just want to thank you, Barry, and anyone who wants to get a hold of me, brimstoneandcompany.com. Archie, and I hope it goes as... Excitingly as this interview went, see you in seven. The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on Internet or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for missionary radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. Then, when you subscribe, we will send you the last quarterly MP3 CD of that program immediately and continue to do so with each new quarter. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host cause 
and anywhere else the Spirit may lead you. Do all to the glory of our God and Creator, for His holy nation, the only kingdom that will last forever. Thank you for listening.